Hello everyone, welcome back to another reaction video. Today we're continuing the unbiased history of Rome. And today we're taking a look at Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Come on, go back and actually read the thing. If you did, congrats! For today we will be covering the middle days of the Pax Romana, a golden age of unrivaled peace and prosperity. Which brings us to a civil war, <laughs> where we left off, <laughs> of course. having died with no heirs that is, the treacherous Praetorian Guard declared support for Galba, at the behest of the Praetorian Prefect, Nymphidaeus, whom offered huge bribes in his name, and just after he had the Senate acclaimed Galba the Emperor... Yeah, so Galba is the first of the so-called... Uh, in the year of the four emperors and that's because there were four emperors in one year <laughs> imagine that but galba was uh, from a wealthy family originally he had climbed the ranks of the curses honorum he had served as a praetor consul and governor so he was quite an experienced politician um, and he had served on many frontiers like upper germany uh, aquitania uh, even uh, Africa at some point. So he'd been around and uh, in the chaos of Nero's um, assassination uh, Galba was able to claim the throne so to speak. But as we will see his reign will not last for very long. He took Spurs as his own wife and then the fucker just gave him to power. Oh yeah. And, and, and like he said the uh, Nymphidaeus, or however you pronounce that, was quite instrumental in his rise. Demanded that his men proclaim him the new emperor, claiming to be the illegitimate son of Caligula. <laughs> Who would want to claim to be the illegitimate <laughs> the son of Caligula? Nymphidaeus promise proves to be his own downfall, making his men kill him and wait until Galba paid them. Speaking of whom, he was still in Hispania, begrudgingly preparing to leave for Rome despite never wanting to be emperor. But you know who wanted to? Otho, that fag Nero had exiled to Lusitania. Apparently he had heard a prophecy that he would one day become emperor, yeah. which he interpreted as Galba one day adopting him as his heir. So he began sucking Galba's cock non-stop, but he never did get noticed. He did gain the favor of Venus, Galba's advisor, but that wasn't enough, not that he knew. But when it came to Galba's character, the man was a hardcore disciplinarian. As he consolidated authority in Hispania, he had every single dissident executed, along with their whole families. As he marched his way to Rome, he fined or sacked every single city that didn't show him strict loyalty. And as he neared Rome, he was faced with a newly raised legion of ex-sailors, whom demanded him to recognize their new status as legionnaires, so he had them slaughtered for insubordination. And the survivors decimated near the Milvian Bridge. Keep this place in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fame as a disciplinarian stretched way back to Caligula. The Milvian Bridge will become a very important, um, very important location in about 200 years or so. But let's keep that one in mind. Was reign when the God Emperor sent him to straighten up the Rhine legions, which he did so effectively that they held a grudge against him for over two decades, which they were allowed to manifest after Galba appointed Aulus Vitellius to govern the Rhine legions. The stereotypical hedonist fat fuck. Ah yes, both Otto and Vitellius are names we're gonna hear about very soon. He ate four full meals a day, threw non-stop parties during duty, and used his scouts to hunt down delicacies Sounds like a fun guy. to stuff his fat throat with. To assist Vitellius, Galba sent Caecina as a legate as well. And if you think Arminius was a traitor, then take a hold of this pleb. The second he got in the Rhine, he began embezzling and taking bribes non-stop. And fearing Galba's rightful retaliation, he plotted together with another legate, Valens, to mount a revolt. Soon after, they had their men show up to Vitellius and proclaim him the new emperor, and he just went along with it. Meanwhile, Galba was getting more and more hate from the senators and praetorians. Yeah, this practice of Roman armies proclaiming uh, their generals to be emperor will continue, I can assure you of that. And it is not for the benefit of the Empire that this practice gets a hold. But yeah, um, this was a practice that became more and more common the further down the road in Roman history we got. And uh, it will result in civil war, spoiler alert. The main reason being that he still didn't bribe them for their support, 
which, as you remember, he never did promise to do. And when the old man Galba finally resolved to name his heir, with Othel by his side, he chose a man named Lysianus. And Othel was livid. Drowned in debt and resentful like mad, not a week later he approached the Praetorian Guard, promising them their bribes, and ordering them to kill Galba for him. Later, a conspirator would come to Galba exposing Othel's plot and claiming to have killed him. Mad at the chaos of the situation, he was lured out alongside Valens and Lysianus, where Othel had the Praetorian Guard attack them, killing them all. And while the Praetorians kicked Galba's head for sport, the Senate readily acclaimed Othel the new emperor. Also, unfortunately, this is standard practice for Rome, where the Praetorian Guard, ostensibly the Emperor's bodyguards, are bribed or actively seek out to conspire against the Emperor. And the reasons for doing so are often extremely selfish. The Praetorian Guard often wanted more... Uh, more raise in salary and bonuses, what we would call bribes today. And uh, many an emperor has fallen to a sort of a praetorian guard when he wasn't exactly willing to give them this uh, often extravagant bonuses that they asked for. So, uh, yeah, it became a situation where Effectively, the Imperial Throne, or the Imperial Purple, as we would call it, was for sale to the highest bidder. And uh, one time they literally uh, auctioned off the Imperial Purple uh, to a man named Didius Julianus. A cursed name indeed. But uh, that's, that's uh, some time from now. With Sporos later taken as the Imperial Wife, again. He then started going over Galba's mail, only then finding out about Vitellius's revolt against Galba, who had now transferred to him. Otho offered to marry Vitellius's daughter, but he was too busy stuffing his face to hear, sending both Valens and Caecina south with his legions. Despite being severely outnumbered, Otho had the luck of Paulinus being in Rome at the time, sending him north with what men he could muster. Yeah, I should mention this too before we move on, that um, Otho is a or was a member of a, a noble family in Rome, Etruscan origins, if you can believe that. And, uh, well, he was initially a friend and courtier to Emperor Nero, and uh, that's his how he got into this whole mess, basically, and due to his connection with Nero. And he inherited uh, Galba's problem of uh, Vitellius, who had rebelled in Germania uh, Inferior. And uh, yeah, he's not the last emperor to deal with Vitellius, I can say that. Paulinus then marched north, holding his position near Cremona and waiting for Balkan reinforcements. Otho then sent the Imperial fleet to raid the southern Gallic coast to distract Valens' army, but all he achieved was killing Agricola's mother. Caecina then arrived in Italy, attacking Paulinus and getting promptly beaten back to Cremona. Valens then arrived with reinforcements, alongside 60,000 German auxiliaries. Paulinus kept holding his position, <laughs> German but then auxiliaries. Another How could you? general, Titanius, took over and attacked Cremona. Contrary to Paulinus' advice, the Othonian forces were then defeated, and having heard of the loss, Otho, seeking to repent for his crimes, killed himself during the night, so he could bring... This is all happening to basically him. during Kissing the span of one Valens year. later captured Paulinus, and, lying through his teeth, he convinced those plebs to release him, leaving his last days in peace. As Vitellius marched south, he passed by the battlefield to smell the fresh blood, later mocking Otho's grave, and continuing to throw parties non-stop. The Senate then bent over and proclaimed to Vitellius the new emperor, who made himself Pontifex Maximus at the anniversary of Brennus' victory before the sack of Rome, and then planned to have Sporus publicly raped in a gladiatorial arena, but he killed himself to avoid the shame. May he rest with Nero. So much food Vitellius would eat while ruling, that he literally bankrupted the empire, later resorting to inviting his debtors to the imperial palace, having them killed and their property confiscated. And speaking- uh, Well, I don't know if it was- uh, he was that frivolous with the state treasury, but Vitellius was by no means a, a top emperor in Roman history. 
and his short reign is a testament to that. Vitellius' position will soon become challenged by another rising star in the Roman Empire, and this one actually, um, you know, would last for some time. He would actually sit on the throne for an extended period. Of debts and money, the Jews were still revolting in Judea. While the emperorship changed hands every few months, both Vespasian and his son Titus were busy ransacking the rebelling Semite cities to the ground. Not by their own doing, though. The Jews just kept mass killing themselves every time they breached the city gates. Go figure. Yeah, so this is the period in Roman history where Judea starts to become more troubled than it's worth. Uh, Judea had been for a long time a client kingdom of Rome. And, and this had been the case ever since Pompey's days, basically. And the problem here is that the Jews are chafing under Roman occupation and rule. And they will launch several major rebellions, which will lead to outright war. You can't even call them rebellions because of the scale. They were wars. So this is at the point where the first uh, uh, Judea-Roman war begins. The last bastion of Jewish resistance was in Jerusalem. But as they prepared to take it, news of Galbus and then Athos and then Vitellius' ascension sequentially arrived to the east making them delay their efforts. Having some plebeian land while as emperor was unacceptable to the eastern governors, among them Missianus in Syria and Alexander in Egypt, whom proclaimed Vespasian the new emperor, convincing the Danubian legions of Illyria, Pannonia and Moesia to join them. Vespasian had never lusted for power, but he changed his mind after discovering an old Trojan prophecy, wildly popular in the east. It said, there will be a time in the world's darkest hour when a divine hero will emerge from the sons and daughters of Troy, conquer the lands of Judea, and become the ruling savior of the world. Vespasian could see how well it fits with- This is very typical of uh, these stories of uh, um, emperors who try to justify their power grab, and they always reference something like this, so... I was divinely called upon to seize the imperial purple and restore the glory of Rome, and- Whatever you need to tell yourself to make you feel better. Uh, but yeah, Vespasian is the last of the emperors that will reign in this year. And uh, unlike the other three that came before him, this guy is actually a bit competent. His current circumstances, and with the blessing of the great heroes of old, Vespasian embraced his new destiny. Among the Danube's legates was a one named Primus, whom took his legions and marched on Rome without orders for a surprise attack. With Valens being sick by then, Vitellius sent Caecina to face off Primus, which would prove an error. Accessing the advantage Vespasian's legions had, he contacted Primus to negotiate a betrayal, but his troops found out and had him locked away in the camp. Reinforced with Vespasian's legions, Primus then faced off the Vitellian forces. Engaging in a long night battle, the sun later dawned on them. The Vespasian troops were invigorated by it and turned to greet the sun which the Vitalian forces took as enemy reinforcements incoming, so they fled the field and left Primus victorious. Primus then continued to march on Rome, and with more and more provincial governors declaring allegiance to Vespasian, our focus goes back to Rome, where Vespasian's youngest son, Domitian, finally comes oh, into God. the picture. Born 12 full years after Titus, Vespasian had his young son raised by his wife and daughter, whom would both tragically die. Yeah, so if you can't already tell, by this reference, Domitian is going to become an emperor later down the line. He is the last uh, emperor of the Flavian dynasty. And he is also, I should say, well, he's one of the longer reigning emperors uh, in Roman history. Leaving Domitian under the care of his uncle Flavius, whom raised him with the help of Nerva, a close friend to the family. Being an INTJ to the core, ah, he Nerva. chose to spend his days alone, reading about history and coming to venerate the first Emperor Augustus as his role model. Occasionally pinning flies that flew by, as Minerva warned him they were up to no good. So yeah, the mission gave much respect unto the gods, especially the goddess of wisdom, whom retributed it by acting as his guardian deity. The mission was present in Rome as three different emperors took over the city, and witness how the Senate bent over to their new masters every time, 
and as Primus approached Rome with his legions, Vitellius tried negotiating with Flavius for a cowardly surrender. But Vitellius' men refused to give up, putting Vitellius in custody and sieging Flavius up in the yeah, this is true. Vitellius actually wanted to negotiate a surrender, but his men didn't let him, and so he was kind of forced to, to fight with Spacian's forces. And, uh, well, yeah, as history uh, makes clear, it wouldn't go well for Vitellius. The Capitoline Hill. Minerva then helped the Domitian to escape, while his uncle bought time for him. Later, Vitellius was brought the corpse of Flavius, being deprived of his last out. Having arrived at the gates of Rome, Primus, hearing of Flavius' death and fearing for Domitian's safety, he ordered his legions to take the city. He eventually breached the walls, and during the chaotic struggle, a fire would break out into the city and consume the Temple of Jupiter himself, which he wouldn't soon forget. As Vitellius tried to flee... No, that's, that's unacceptable. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with Roman mythology, uh, Jupiter Optimus Maximus was the chief god of the Roman pantheon. And so desecrating his temple is, um, you know, kind of an affront to the gods that is uh, intolerable. He went to the palace to get as much food as possible with him, only to be found and taken by Primus's legionnaires. He would be later brought to the Roman Forum, where he was beheaded and his body thrown to the Tiber River. Further angering to Don't be calm, he's not allowed. <laughs> by them. Vespasian then returned oh to the east and was proclaimed the new emperor by the senate, because, of course. Later, as he visited a temple, he was stricken Yeah, if you haven't noticed by now, the role of the senate is rather ceremonial. Um, they still had a role in governing in the various provinces and the city of Rome itself, but by and large, all of their powers has been, at this point, transferred to the princeps, or the emperor, as we would call him. And uh, the power of the senate would only continue to diminish. They still had prestige at this point, but even their prestige will be reduced with time. And by the end of it, uh, the senate is basically a local town council for rich people. So yeah. By a divine vision. As two plebs came to help him, Vespasian accidentally conjured a divine healing spell, curing them of their injuries. Wow. From there on, Vespasian would be recognized as yet another divine emperor. But while his father worked miracles as the new emperor, Titus was left in Judea with the task of pacifying the province and retake Jerusalem from the rebels. He had four legions at his disposal and several auxiliaries against 20,000 fractioned Jews behind the walls. Once Titus arrived, he tried scouting ahead, but was suddenly raided by the Jews, slaughtering several Semites to escape with his life. He then began building a forward camp, but then the Jews raided again, but he repelled them and got it built, encircling the city and officially starting the siege. The legionary siege weapons were constantly harassed by the Jews, but Titus fended them off until the walls were breached. He led his men through the breach, but the Jews had retreated to the second set of walls, and the Antonia fortress behind it, and the Temple Mount walls behind it. After a long back and forth, Titus reached the second walls. And basically a, a turtle defense going on here. And laid siege to the Antonia. As the Roman siege weapons raged, the Jews were up to their tricks again, digging up a cave underneath and setting fire to the foundation, having it collapse on the Romans. And after more back and forth struggles, Ingenious. Titus pulled a Caesar and settled with having his legions compete in building a wall to encircle the walls of oh the Oh god. Enemy, letting the Jews starve to No. <laughs> We're back to the Elysia tactics again. Ah, uh, yeah. I guess we can all call ourselves Caesars now. Yeah. This is a very interesting tactic. I mean, it works, so why not? But still, it seems like everybody is copying Caesar at this point. The Jewish factions began to conflict between themselves, ending with the zealots destroying the food supplies of the city, ensuring that they would all either die fighting or die starving. And as Titus crucified his Jewish prisoners alive, Jupiter conjured up a storm to smite the Semites, having the Antonia fortress collapse in its weakened foundations. Titus didn't let the chance slip and ordered a charge uphill, but the Jews defended it fanatically. So, the next night, a band of 24 legionnaires sneaked into the Antonia, killed the defenders and sounded the horns. Titus then came with his forces and gained a footing in the Antonia, having it destroyed to facilitate a breach. 
but that didn't mean the Jews were anywhere near giving up. Titus then ordered an assault on the Temple Mount. The Semites used their Jewish magic to set fire to the top, forcing a retreat. Wow. Now having lost all restraint, Titus ordered a massive assault through the breach, breaking through and taking more and more of the Temple Mount. And as the Jews were pushed back, a soldier grabbed a flaming piece of wood and threw it over the walls. Shortly after the fire began spreading, engulfing the Holy of Holies and throwing the Jews in disarray. Titus then broke through the Temple Mount's walls and had his legions slaughter the remaining rebels. Titus would later crush the last pockets of rebel resistance, and as he was acclaimed Imperator by his troops, he sacrificed a bow in the honor of Jupiter, thanking him for this victory. In total, 1.1 million Jews would die as a result according to Josephus, a Jewish historian that remained loyal to the end. Uh, yeah. Now I don't know about that number, but the Judean Wars, the Roman Judean Wars were extremely brutal and there were hundreds of thousands of casualties easily. And uh, this is a problem that would persist until the Emperor Hadrian finally puts an end to it all and incorporates Judea as a Roman province, finally. But yeah, uh, this is Titus's uh, greatest accomplishment, winning this war. And as you could tell by the fighting, it was brutal, it was very difficult for the Romans, but they managed. And... Uh, yeah, as I said, this is a problem that will crop up in the future. Empire. But yeah, the Jews as a whole would yet continue on revolting. Yeah. Twice, but no more. Hadrian would make sure of that. Shh, shh, we're getting there. But right now, it's all about Vespasian, Titus and Domitian, as the Free Flavians celebrated the founding of their new dynasty, showcasing mountains of Jewish gold, the menorah and the Pentateuch as trophies. The new dynasty's first challenge would be to acquit the 40 billion sesterces worth of money the Roman state was in debt for. You can thank Vitellius's fat throat for that. Among his many tactics to raise money, Vespasian led the senators outbid each other to get positions in government, exploited monopolies for the state's benefit, hunted down corrupt tax collectors, and even taxed the plebs for their urine. Eventually, his son Titus, now the- Yeah, so, unfortunately, not much uh, information survives about Vespasian's 10 year, or 10 year um, reign. However, what we do know is that he did a lot of work to stabilize the empire's economy and he was able to consolidate his political position, which brought stability to the empire overall. So, by all accounts, Vespasian was an above average uh, emperor, and uh, yeah, it's really unfortunate, as I said, that. We don't know more about his reign, uh, but the the point about uh, urine tax collection that's a thing actually. Uh, so yeah, he found many more streams of revenue to pay off the state's debts and fill the coffers of the empire. The Praetorian prefect and fucking the Jewish queen. He came to think of the taxes immoral. And when confronted by him, Vespasian gave Titus one of the urine tax money coins, and he was disgusted by its stench. Plebeian money always stinks. And speaking of plebs, Vespasian used all that Jewish gold to build a massive amphitheater to entertain the masses, then known as the Flavian Amphitheater, and now as the Colosseum. Yes, it was Vespasian who ordered the construction of the Flavian Amphitheater, and it was Titus, or Titus, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, who finished the construction. And uh, it is perhaps uh, the most famous symbol of Rome that we still have with us today. And it's uh, quite remarkable that this building has stood there for 2,000 years, give or take a few years. And it is remarkably intact considering all that it went through throughout the, the many perils that the city of Rome has seen and I'm not talking just the um, the Roman period but even the period afterwards during, under the papal states Rome was sacked in 1453 no we're not, no that was an sack of Constantinople um, anyways it was sacked in the early 1500s I remember that uh, by the Germans, no less. God. Anyways, <laughs> that was just my side tangent about the Colosseum. 
You think it sounds better? I think it sounds better. During all this, both of his sons would get married. The mission to his lifelong love Longina, the daughter of Kobulo, whom would bear him a child, but he didn't survive long. And Titus married way back when with Marcia, a descendant of Uncus Marcius, and even better, the aunt of a young military genius named Trajan. Okay, Hell yeah! Did it, we're almost there! Vespasian also allowed for great freedom of speech, even allowing some Greeks to link his lineage to one of Hercules' companions, so they could aggrandize their Greekoid hero. Not mentioned so far was the time when the Batavians, Germans, took advantage of the weakness caused by the civil war and revolted against the empire. Among the rebel leaders was a Gaul named Julius Sabinus. <laughs> now get this. He claimed that his great-grandmother had been one of Caesar's many consulates. He claimed the entirety of Gaul for himself, even getting the germs to help him out. They encircled two legions. Well, um, I gotta say that's a creative way of um, legitimizing your power grab. But yeah, this is, like I said, this is very common. Usurpers often claimed some sort of flimsy, tangential reason for their revolt. And uh, if they didn't claim, uh, you know, that they had a prophecy or something instruct them to do this, uh, well, there was also always the ancestral connections they could just make up. This with their hordes, and once they agreed to accept the surrender, they had all legionnaires slaughtered. Never, ever trust a germ. To deal with this Germanic shit show, Vespasian sent his brother-in-law to crush the rebellion, humiliating the Batavians and forcing the LARPer into exile. The mission had been eager to help crush the revolt, but it had already been crushed by the time the letter arrived. Vespasian would then spend his later years enjoying life with his boomer friends, such as the naturalist Pliny the Elder, celebrating both peace and victory. And after nearly finishing the Colosseum, he was the one to add that solar crown to the Colossus of Nero, reassigning it in honor of Sol, the Romano Trojan solar deity. He couldn't quite put it to words, but there was something about it that... Yeah, so with time, the traditional Roman pantheon as we know it with Mars, Jupiter, Venus would uh, shift more towards a focus on soul. And that's where we get this um, religion, you could call it, of soul invictus, the worshipping of the sun as the greatest deity. And there's a certain, uh, you know, certain great emperor who championed the cause of Sol Invictus, <coughs> Aurelian. Oh wait, this repetition reminds me, we have a conspiracy to cover right now. Yes, even with Vespasian being so likable, there were still those who would betray him, namely Caecina. Why? Who the fuck knows? Maybe he was half German or something, sources disagree, but he didn't go anywhere, as Titus was there to do his job. Soon after, he invited Caecina for dinner, and while he ate, he stabbed him in the back. Let none say Titus didn't know irony. And serving the empire diligently, he would hold a total of seven consulships during his father's reign, always stepping out of power in the- Seven consulships, uh... Yeah, at this point, the consulship doesn't mean anything, but still, uh... Inherit having that office seven times was quite unprecedented. The only one who had been able to have hold seven consulship is Marius, if you remember him. And that was at the time when the Office of Consul held a great amount of power. Uh, so it's not that impressive, considering the Emperor basically appointed all the Consuls at this point. The middle of his office in favor of the mission, which only increased his disdain for the Senate even more. Back to the promises, Vespasian appointed Agricola as the governor of Britannia, whom had just married his daughter to Tacitus, THE Tacitus, whom he would have recorded. Tacitus, the great Roman historian and he was of senatorial rank, and uh, he is one of the most important sources we have on the Roman Empire. And, uh, yeah, what can I say? It's a great boon for us historians to have his uh, access to his source material still in rather intact condition. ...for his attempt to live up to his mentor Paulinus. As Agricola arrived in the province, he started out by crushing a revolt by the recently conquered Welsh, where he later found an exiled Hibernian king called Tuafo, Tuafo. and asked for his help in retaking his throne. Agricola what a then name. crossed the sea no Roman had ever crossed and ran a punitive campaign in Hibernia, Proto-Ireland, that is. Proto-Ireland. But he never bothered actually conquering the place. Ireland was, 
is and will always be worthless. And as Agricola breaks... Now, that's fair. Um, these, there was no strategic or economical value in conquering Ireland. And the same can be said about Britain, um, or, yeah, the British Isles in general. Um, I'm afraid England and Scotland does not contribute much to the imperial coffers in terms of man... Uh, yeah, in, or it doesn't even contribute in terms of manpower. So, you know, it's, I'm sorry to say, a useless Roman province that should have just been left alone. But the Romans in their, in their, um, how should I say, magnanimous um, thinking decided they must civilize these barbarians, and uh, they were able to accomplish that to uh, a relatively great extent. I mean, uh, it would still remain pretty tribalish, but the major population centers became Roman, like uh, Londinium, for example. Bravely pushed the borders of civilization further north, he was suddenly attacked by the honorless Picts of Caledonia. The Proto-Scots of Proto-Scotland, that is. Agricola then demolished the Scots in the battlefield, but every time he did so, they cowardly fled to hide in the highlands. Civilizing them would prove an arduous task. Yeah, unfortunately for the Romans and their plans to take Caledonia, it just proved too much trouble and there was really not much to gain from conquering Caledonia. Like, it wasn't a great natural resources or anything like that to benefit the Empire. And so, you know, they made a good call there to just stop. Why? Why go further? Back to the Eternal City, we can see the years haven't been as kind to the Emperor as they have to his friends. Now suffering from a terminal case of severe diarrhea. As his Ooh. life neared its end, Vespasian proclaimed that an Emperor ought to die on his feet. Getting up. And after taking another massive liquid shit, the truth dawned on him. Dear me, I think I'm becoming a god. Then falling dead in the embrace of his caretakers. After presiding over his funeral, Titus succeeded him as emperor, later expelling Berenice from Rome. And this is actually the first time in Roman history that uh, a son succeeds his father as emperor. Fearing that he would fall prey to her eastern temptations. To further celebrate his victory in Judea, he built the Ark of Titus, the glory of which would make generations of Romabus build replicas for themselves. And as far as the Senate went, they sucked Titus's cock like you wouldn't believe. And the Ark of Titus still exists. Uh, unless I'm confusing it with some other Ark that's still left. Uh, but yeah, this was built in his honor and would stand for generations to come. And there's good reason for it. He abolished treason trials, never exiled anyone over anything, didn't kill a single one of them, and one day, after having given no favors to any of his friends, he deemed it a wasted day. And while everything was going dandy, Vulcanus was sleeping underneath the Vesuvius, until a sword fell into his head. Woken up, he realized it was a gladiatorial sword, aka a slave sword, aka Filthy slaves have been fucking about on top of his property. <laughs> Exploding in anger, Vulcanus made the Vesuvius erupt in a furious rage. I fucking told you this would happen. I, I really fucking did. Among the many casualties were Pliny the Elder, whom died trying to rescue his friends from such a fate. Several thousands of plebs also died, but who gives a shit? Well, Titus kinda did. Diverting massive imperial funds to help out the worthless masses. And yeah, it was under Titus's reign that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius happened, and where the city of Pompeii was buried on, uh, buried under uh, lots of volcanic ash. And Titus was very generous in the rescue efforts here, and he spent a, day, a great deal of the imperial treasury trying to um, alleviate the situation for the various refugees and uh, the surrounding areas around Pompeii. And that's to his great credit, actually. Uh, and of course, this eruption is very important to us because Pompeii uh, became preserved, basically. And it has offered us an enormously valuable insight into how Roman life was at this time. 
and uh, we can see that by looking at what was preserved, the pottery, and the various other things that were preserved uh, for millennia, undisturbed until really the 1800s and 1900s, where the excavation of the city um, began. So, you know, it's a tragic that so many people lost their lives there, but for us uh, historians, it's a really um, invaluable insight into how the Romans lived. To open up some fresh wounds, another great fire broke out in Rome. This time burning Agrippa's pantheon to the ground. No. And while Titus put down the fires, in the east, a man proclaiming to be Nero reborn emerged, gathering some gullible Greek hordes to follow him as he laid claim to the empire. Plenty of Julian Larping today, isn't there? But this one was no different. He would flee his way into Parthia, where he met his end. And after calming down the fires, Titus ordered a massive bathing complex built further indulging the plebs with the architectural wonders of civilization, making him even more loved and respected than his father. But after just two years as emperor, while traveling Sabine lands, Titus grew increasingly weak and fragile. As he laid in bed, realizing death was near, he proclaimed to have made only one mistake in his life, and then died. I believe we all know what he meant. What killed him, you ask? Well, Berenice was quite bitter about being scorned. You yes, see, Eastern and Black Magic. Of Jews and thing too, I suppose. So she used her Jewish magic to have a fire. Oh, not even to Eastern brain. Black Magic, it's Jewish magic. And slowly chewing it over the years. Yeah, Minerva isn't the goddess of wisdom for no reason. Domitian was then acclaimed the new emperor. Yeah, so Titus was, by all accounts, a very competent gem uh, emperor himself, too. However, his very short reign and the lack of sources on this era of history uh, makes it hard to determine what he actually managed to accomplish. Uh, his main achievements was the completion of the Flavian Amphitheater, the Ark of Titus, and his efforts in the aftermath of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And, uh, well, with his death... Uh, Vespasian's youngest son, Domitian, took over. And Domitian is a very controversial character in Roman historiography, uh, mainly because his reign was marked by uh, a stark contrast to the principate ideals of Augustus, whereby he styles himself as a very much more autocratic, senate, uh, autocratic emperor, and his relationship with the Senate was absolutely terrible. And I think we will... Uh, See that explained here in the coming minutes. And as a prelude to his reign, Domitian had his elder brother deified just like his father, without even consulting the Senate for approval. Yeah, um, by this point, the it has become standard practice ever since Augustus died, basically, to deify every Roman emperor after their deaths. And this is known as the imperial cult. And... Uh, uh, this was very common, but it required, in theory, Senate approval before deification could take place. And Domitian, like uh, we just saw, he didn't bother to consult the Senate. He had absolute disdain for everything the Senate, the Senate as an institution and the, the members of the Senate. Because if there is one thing to be sure about the mission, was that he absolutely despised the Senate. Oh After yes. years of seeing how the senators treacherously bent over for any usurper who took over power and did nothing but to serve as bootlickers for both his father and brother, he denounced the senators as what they really were, treacherous parasites of no honor, being nothing but an He's insult to the noble senators of old, of which only Nerva and a few others still lived up to. Being the huge Augustus Buddha he was, Domitian sought to emulate the original princeps in every possible way. He both micromanaged and macromanaged the empire to run as efficiently as possible, elected the most capable men as possible to serve in positions of government, used taxes to build several projects for the public good, threw games constantly to entertain the masses, and of course, persecuted degenerates without mercy. 
Also, much like Augustus, Domitian spent a lot of time in the provinces, making it clear that imperial authority went with him, and the senators could fucking suck it, <laughs> often raising their taxes, confiscating their property, and limiting the size of their wine farms, just to fuck with them. Such was Domitian's hatred for the senate, he would occasionally invite the senators for dinner in a black room, with tombstones as chairs with their names <laughs> carved on them. Oh, that, would be if that's true, that's Domitian hilarious. Let them go peacefully, satisfied with having tasted their fear. He then used his staggering IQ to fix the inflated economy, increasing the purity of the coins from 90% to 98% silver. And if you're curious why you should care, it's because he will be the only emperor to actually fix inflation like this, with one very notable exception down the line. Then using said fixed economy to rebuild the Temple of Jupiter, and then raising the common legionnaires pay by 33%, making them love him unconditionally. Jupiter remained pissed though. Yeah, so Domitian was, by all accounts, a very effective emperor, and uh, Dovatir just explained to us some of his reforms and some of his accomplishments. But he's very controversial, because he did this in an authoritarian style. And like I said, he despised the Senate authority, completely ignored it, undermined the institution at every turn, and the Roman people and army seems to have loved him, but uh, he made many enemies, many powerful enemies, doing it this way, going about it. Um, so yeah. And uh, the point about inflation is quite interesting, especially in the times we live in. And it was, there was very, very, very few emperors who actually managed to handle inflation in a good way. And, of course, they didn't have our modern understanding of the economy and like we do today. We know how to fight inflation, in theory at least, uh, with the interest rates and all of that. And, uh, well, <laughs> I'm sad to say that most Roman emperors did not have that foresight. However, much like Augustus, Domitian was deeply concerned about the Germanic threat to civilization. For if not even the divine Augustus could civilize those chaotic animals, then Domitian settled with the next best thing, pushing the Germans as far away from Rome as possible, and building a series of fortifications to connect to the Rhine and Danube rivers, later known as the Limes Germanicus. And while the walls were still being built, Domitian was viciously attacked by a large German horde, provoked by the smell of constructions nearby. The emperor then obliterated the barbarians, and kicked them back to their mud huts. He would later celebrate a well-deserved triumph for his victory, and be overjoyed with good news from Britannia. For this whole time, Agricola was fighting his way through Scotland, finishing the conquest of Britannia for Rome, with the exception of the Highlands, where the remaining proto-Scots still cowardly hidden. But Agricola decided to let them be, letting those animals claim to be unconquered in their reservation areas. <laughs> reservation he areas. Years trying to civilize as many Britons as possible, but that would always be left a job half done. And as a reward for his efforts, the mission recalled him to celebrate his accomplishments, letting the Scots slowly retake their lands. After all, Scotland was, is, and will always be worthless. <laughs> you know, not all barbaric shitholes were worthless. The Asia comes to mind. The kingdom in the Carpathian Mountains was filled with gold mines, and sadly, Dacians. They would occasionally cross the Danube and raid Moesia along fractioned tribes, cowering away before they met any Roman retaliation. But it all changed with the Cabalus, a barbarian king that killed the governor Moesia and united the Dacians under his rule. Insulted by their actions, Domitian sent the Praetorian prefect to push them back, which he did. But as he encroached further, the mischievous Dacians ambushed them, slaughtering his legions and taking the Praetorian eagle standard. No. Domitian then took matters into his. Oh, the humiliation involved in that has got to be staggering. This is the Praetorian Guard, this is the Emperor's Bodyguard Unit, which often, well, in the early years at least, served with the Emperor on campaign as the elite units of the Empire. And losing their sta Eagle Standard is... Whoa, that's, that's, that's not good. It basically makes it impossible for the Romans to sit back. And they would have to respond to this humiliation. His own hands, crossing with three legions and continually pushing the Cabalus back. And as he was about to crush him, another revolt broke out in the Rhine. The mission was then forced to give lighter terms for a quick peace, appointing the Cabalus as a client king and granting him with the funds necessary to protect his borders against the germs, which he instead, of course, would use to fund yet another invasion of the empire. 
What happened in the Rhine wasn't interesting at all, just our average butthurt senatorial conspiracy to score some petty revenge against the Emperor, even allying with the germs to carry it through. <laughs> Their plan was to let the germs cross the Rhine and join up with his legions, but Jupiter, at Minerva's request, denied their efforts, summoning a storm over the river, thus making a crossing possible. But the real reason why the revolt failed was that Domitian sent none other than Trajan himself to oh, cross yes. the revolt, which he accomplished flawlessly. Unfortunately, the other legate heading the expedition, being a conspirator himself, had all the incriminating documents burned, saving his fellow traitors back in Rome from being discovered. To restore order, Domitian assumed the consulship alongside Nerva and began purging the Senate of any senators he deemed traitorous. Yeah, Nerva was a um, senator. He's been mentioned several times already for a good reason. And Nerva was a senator of the old school, uh, of the Republican style virtues he upheld, and he was quite respected, um, even by someone who hated the Senate, like Domitian. Um, and Nerva would, of course, become the first of the so-called five good emperors, which we will get to in the next video. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, good on him, I guess. Good on Nerva, you know, for staying in the good graces of the Senate-hating emperor. Later awarding Trajan with his own consulship. Well deserved. Despite his utter hatred for them and great justifications for it, the mission wouldn't purge much. Hell, fucking Claudius purged more people than he did. But that didn't stop those parasites from fearing and hating him. Indeed, they came up with a plot to kill the mission. Part of the plan relied on how the mission was long ago prophesied to meet his death at midday, making him lower his guard after such time had passed. And recently, the mission had been visited by Minerva in a dream, informing him Jupiter wouldn't allow her to protect him anymore, being left abandoned by the gods. Feeling vulnerable, he kept asking a servant what time it was before leaving for work, and him, being among the senatorial plotters, lied, saying it was past noon. Relaxed, the mission returned to his office to attend the Empire. He was then approached by another senatorial conspirator, claiming to have discovered a plot against the Emperor, but the injury was a fake. And as the mission read the document, the conspirator took the dagger he had hidden and stabbed the Emperor, failing to actually kill him in one hit only then calling the other conspirators to join the attack, collectively stabbing Domitian to death. Yet another good emperor, a victim of conspiracy and assassination. Funny how the Praetorians remained loyal this time. Well, that's good. <laughs> say, but where were they? They remained loyal to the emperor, but where were they? They're supposed to protect the emperor. Emperors. Ciao, ciao. Alright, that was the end of that episode the pax romana the roman peace the golden age of the roman empire the apex of its existence and uh, domitian is quite an interesting case he is uh, one of those emperors that has been looked upon differently in the modern era and uh, modern revisionist historians would characterize domitian as ruthless but an efficient autocrat whose uh, cultural, economic, political programs, they basically provided the foundations for the Pax Romana and the um, M45 good emperors that would follow. And uh, yeah, Nerva, who was mentioned at the end, will immediately succeed the mission as emperor, and we'll talk about him the next time. But anyways, uh, thank you for watching this video, and if you have any comments, uh, insights you want to offer, Please leave them in the comment section below and subscribe for more.